Once again, welcome to the Blaze Sports Institute for Applied Science. This is a CDSS Level 2 curriculum session. And today we're going to talk about Paralympic Sport Classification. This is Classification 101, where we'll provide you a basic overview of Paralympic Sport Classification. So Paralympic Sport Classification, uh, a little bit of an introduction, uh, what it is, what it's for. And as you can see there, uh, as with other sports that utilize classification systems, it provides a framework for people with disabilities to compete. Uh, one of its aims is to make sure that the disability has as little impact on the result of an athletic competition as possible and that skill development uh, really is what goes into that and that people can compete on an equitable playing field. And we'll get into how classification does that uh, here in a few moments. Um, but again, it, the, the basic purpose of classification really boils down to creating a fair and equitable playing field so that uh, practice, training, knowledge, the talent of the athletes, strategies, skill development, uh, and really to some extent coaching come into play to determine the result and not the disability of the athletes that are competing within the competition. Well, what does inter international classification do? Um, again, it provides a structure for competition, and there's a number of different ways it does that throughout the different sports. Um, and as we'll see, there's a difference between some individual sports and team sports and how classification is used to create that equitable playing field. Uh, again, uh, a little bit different than what we just discussed, classification makes sure that an athlete's impairment is relative to the sport performance and ensures that the athlete uh, competes equitably with others. But what does that really mean? Uh, well, what that means uh, when we look at the second bullet point, the athlete's impairment is relative to the sport. And one of the current issues in uh, Paralympic sport classification now has to do with uh, track and field or track and particularly road racing. When you think of something uh, long road races, 10Ks, but more so marathons, and you think of some of the track classifications, and we'll get into those later, but one of the classifications is for athletes who have amputations, and one of the classifications within uh, the amputation category would be upper arm, uh, upper extremity amputations, and how does someone with a below the elbow amputation, how much does that amputation, how much does that disability actually affect their ability to compete at a marathon level or possibly even a 10K level? Are they really at a disadvantage relative to runners with no disability at all? The One of the other issues, uh, again, with road racing, think about an athlete with a visual impairment, an athlete who actually has some visual acuity, is not totally blind, but qualifies within other Paralympic sports uh, because they do have a visual impairment, but how much does that visual impairment actually hinder them or disable them relative to an athlete with no visual impairment in a distance race such as a marathon? If that athlete with a visual impairment can run without a guide, can train, and can see the road, can see the course, and really is not disadvantaged or impaired relative to an athlete with no visual impairment at all, does that athlete belong in the Paralympic Games? Does that athlete belong in Paralympic sport, or should that athlete simply just be competing against other people without any disabilities at all? Those are some of the current issues going on in Paralympic sport classification. Some of the questions the classification aims to answer, and again, uh, make sure that the impairment is relative to sport performance and ensures that the athlete competes equitably with other athletes. And as we get into some of these current issues, equitably not only with other athletes with disabilities, but also equitably with other athletes that may not have a disability. The purpose of classification, um, and you can see there, determine eligibility to complete, compete and group athletes for competition. Uh, we'll get into uh, grouping or determine eligibility to complete here in a moment. Uh, now, to group athletes for competition, again, when we look at individual sports versus team sports, there's two two different methods that are used. When you look at individual sports, you're looking at grouping athletes one-on-one. -on -one. So you're basically looking at putting athletes together that have virtually the same type of impairment, 
that results in the same possible functional levels. When we look at team sports, we have to put a group of athletes on the floor against another group of athletes and try to ensure that those two groups are equitable. And uh, that uh, raises some other challenges, again, that we'll get into here in a moment. Uh, eligibility to complete, compete, obviously, the first role of classification is to make sure that uh, an athlete actually has a disability. And believe it or not, there are some uh, current uh, issues going on. You can Google uh, fake disability or Paralympic sport fake disability, and you will see that there have been some Paralympic athletes that have been found to have been faking their disability for a number of years. Um, obviously, there's some uh, psychological issues going on there, but also as the Paralympic Games gain notoriety and more money comes into disabled sport, people are going to want to compete. And it doesn't matter, you know, what, uh, what genre you operate in, people cheat. And Paralympic sport is no different. And people do fake their disabilities. And classification does need to be designed to make sure we can find those people that are trying to cheat and eliminate them from competition. Classification has evolved over the years. Initially, um, in, back in 1960, uh, and prior to that with the Stoke Mandeville Games, uh, the games were primarily for people with spinal, spinal cord injuries. And uh, as a result, classification was a pure medical test. Well, what does that mean? That means they, they evaluated the level of injury, if it was a complete injury or an incomplete injury, and you were assigned a classification simply based on that. Uh, spinal cord injuries, especially when they're complete, are pretty cut and dry. And even when they're incomplete, uh, it, you're almost looking at a black and white issue with very few gay, gray areas. Um, and now it, it's changed. Obviously, as we've added all the different disability classes into Paralympic sport, sport in addition to people with spinal cord injury, have people with visual impairments, uh, people with cerebral palsy, brain injury, stroke, um, people with amputations, uh, dwarfs, and uh, as we'll get into it, we also have what's called les autres, which is the others. Uh, so there are a wide range of disabilities out there that um, that provide someone eligibility to compete with an adapted uh, disability in Paralympic sport that don't fit precisely into those categories, uh, but they are eligible to compete. And because we've, we've gotten into all those different types of disability classes, it's required us to, to evolve the classification system. And now we're in a more uh, functionally based system, which requires more than just a simple, simple medical test or even a manual muscle test. It involves observing the athletes, and the athletes are not only observed during a classification session, but they're actually observed while they're competing while they're training, while they're practicing, they're even observed while they're eating. Uh, at a Paralympic Games, an athlete uh, is not really classified until they've been, been observed in all different areas. And a person's classification can change if a classifier uh, sees them in a dining hall doing tasks that they previously claimed they were not able to do. Uh, they see them do it. For instance, someone might, uh, a wheelchair basketball player might be a class one uh, which means they have a very high level of injury, um, above T4 most likely, and uh, that means they have virtually no function in their core, no abs, uh, very difficult to balance. Uh, if a classifier sees that athlete who's who's being proposed as a class one, you know, reach over, perfect balance, grab something off the floor, come back up using their trunk muscles, that's going to affect their classification. Uh, it's going to be taken into account. Um, the third bullet point, uh, there are uh, two disability groups that use uh, only a uh, medically based test, uh, the visually impaired, uh, a visual acuity test, and intellectually impaired, which is a classification coming back into the Paralympic Games for London. And that is, that is an evolving process as well because there have been issues with determining if someone actually has an intellectual impairment. And that continues to evolve and will continue to evolve uh, and we'll see how it goes in London. Hopefully there'll be no controversy and we'll be able to keep moving forward and, and keep those classes within the Paralympic movement. Um, they were removed after Sydney because there was a big scandal with the intellectually impaired uh, basketball team, stand-up basketball team from Spain 
uh, the majority of their athletes were found to have had no intellectual impairment whatsoever. They cheated the system. And it's uh, it, classification is really having a difficult time trying to determine a foolproof way to determine if someone actually does have an intellectual impairment. Now we talked about one of the purposes of classification is to determine eligibility to compete. And one of the things that comes into play there is minimum disability. Well, what's minimum disability? Well, that's when there's no, uh, no, re no perfect fit, again, into those classification groups, but a person does have a permanent physical disability that, that hinders their ability to compete in the able-bodied version of that sport. Uh, and as you see, that disability must be measurable and it must be permanent. It can't, I can't just blow out my knee. I can't blow out my ACL and go play wheelchair basketball legally <laughs> uh, until it heals and then go play stand-up basketball again. It has to be a permanent injury. But disability does, minimum disability does vary from sport to sport. And, and again, the big thing is does that permanent measurable disability impede that person's ability to play the able-bodied version of the sport at a competitive level. And one example for that, one of the best U.S. women's wheelchair basketball players we've ever had, had blown her knee out multiple times as a college athlete. She tore her ACL numerous times and got to the point where it was a completely unstable joint. And the orthopedist said, had basically determined that she no longer had any ability to move laterally. She could run in a straight line fine, but any lateral movement uh, was just not possible for her anymore. Uh, now, obviously, if you want to play stand-up basketball, you have to be able to move laterally and cut. And she was determined medically to no longer have that ability. So she met the criteria for wheelchair basketball for minimal disability. Now, would she meet the criteria for wheelchair racing? Well, Probably not, because when you think about wheelchair racing, you're essentially running in a straight line. Certainly road racing, we get back to that idea of uh, those distance runners, and does a person with an upper extremity below the elbow amputation, are they really at a disadvantage as a person with a visual impairment that does have vis some visual acuity and can run without a guide, uh, are they disadvantaged? Is a person who can run perfectly in a straight line um, but not laterally, are they really disadvantaged in a long distance road race? And those are the questions that come into play and the things that uh, the classification system needs to answer. So what, what other sports utilize classifications? Are there other sports that utilize classification systems? Is this unique to Paralympic sports? Some people that are new to Paralympic sport and hearing about it for the first time react uh, negatively to the classification system. I've heard some people say that it devalues the sport, that you're not putting the best people out there, that uh, it, it, for some reason that uh, the utilization of the classification system means that it's not real sport. Well, if that's the case, does that mean that boxing is not a real sport since uh, um, you don't have Pacquiao fighting a heavyweight? Uh, does that mean that uh, weightlifting is not a real sport since you compete by weight classes. Uh, you don't have someone who weighs uh, 100 kilograms compete against someone that weighs 60 kilograms. They compete within their own weight classes. Does that mean that virtually every model of sport we have where we separate males from females, that those really aren't sports, that all sports should be co-ed? Those are all examples of classification systems, and they're used throughout sport. Uh, they're used. Uh, they're used in daily life, and it's 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 just part of the way. It's part of what the a mechanism we use to create equitable competition across sport. It's not unique to Paralympic sport. It's just that in Paralympic sport, we have to go so much further because there are so many more considerations uh, to be had. What I want to do now is just give uh, a little overview of some of uh, the different uh, classes uh, or classification categories, disability classes. Uh, again, we said one of the classes, uh, people with cerebral palsy, brain injury, and stroke, although I'm a slide ahead because we're on visually impaired classes right now. So uh, obviously, again, one of the class categories is people with visual impairments and blindness. 
and there are three categories for people with visual impairments and blindness and the B1s and the B1s are considering considered people who are totally blind um, as you can see no light perception or some light perception but cannot recognize the shape of a hand at any distance now people who typically compete in the B1 classes across the sports are required to wear uh, opaque uh, lenses or masks as they compete uh, because obviously you do have two two subcategories within B1 people with no light perception people with some light perception so to make sure that they're on an equitable playing field when they compete they have to everyone regardless of whether they they say they have light perception or not are required to wear some type of opaque uh, apparatus over their eyes so that they're competing on a uh, equitable playing field. And then the B2 class, a uh, person has some visual acuity and will probably utilize uh, a guide um, as the B1 classes would um, in, in the various sports that would lend themselves to the use of a guide. And then in the B3 class, you've got a little bit more visual acuity. You can see the, the, the 260 uh, you can see two meters at uh, two meters was normally seen at 60 meters. So obviously severe uh, visual impairment. All three classes are considered legally blind. And the B3s, however, though, that's that uh, that's that classification group we talked about that um, generally does not need a guide, can run on a track without any assistance, uh, can run a uh, train, run down the road, run a course, can see enough where they're going to be safe and does not need any assistance to train uh, for for that sport. Now, obviously, so, uh, someone with the B3 class, if you can only see at two meters, was normally seen at 60 meters. When you get into cycling, uh, now that's something where you're probably you are going to be on a tandem bike and you're going to have a pilot that it has uh, um, that has sight. Uh, because as you're traveling at 20, 30, 40 miles per hour, uh, you're going to be in a bit of trouble if uh, you can only see something, uh, um, recognize something at 2 meters when you should have seen it at 60 meters away and plan your adjustments. So, one of the again, one of the disability classes that we talk about, one of the categories of impairment is blindness and visual impairments. Another, uh, again, being reintroduced back into London is uh, people with intellectual disabilities. And uh, the international organization that governs this is the International Sports Federation for Persons with an Intellectual Disability, also known as INAS FID. And uh, when you might say, okay, well, what, you know, what, what is a person with an intellectual disability? Well, here's some of the, the criteria. Um, the onset of the disability had to occur prior to age 18. It uh, generally is presented with an IQ below 75, and as you can see, a limitation to two more adaptive skill areas. And those skill areas: communication, self-care, social skills, home living, health, safety. Um, so that really opens up a wide range of uh, intellectual impairments and cognitive impairments that uh, would fall under this realm. Now, some of you might be saying, "Well," IQ below 75. So how is that? How is that different from Special Olympics? And that's that's a really um, this is a really unique situation. And I encourage you to investigate this a little bit on your own, find out a little bit more. But in a nutshell, when we think about Special Olympics, the population group is virtually the same. Um, the difference being Special Olympics exists for participation. Uh, it exists to provide uh, the ability to participate in sport and recreation, and it groups people together based on what their performance levels are. So you have good competitions, and where INOS Fit comes in, they take those athletes that are competing on a participatory level, and that may want to compete on a competitive level, may want to compete and do so at a competitive level, possibly reaching the Paralympic Games and gives them that opportunity. And really that's the only difference when you look at Special Olympics versus INOS FID. INOS FID is that competitive arm that can take those athletes to the next level.
Now we get to the slide that I jumped ahead to. Uh, people with cerebral palsy, brain injury, and stroke. CP ISRA is the international governing body uh, for people that would fall under this uh, classification category. Uh, there are eight classes within that, and as you can see, we've got four classes uh, for people with cerebral palsy, brain injury, stroke that would utilize a wheelchair during competition, and four classes for those who would be ambulatory during competition. And a little breakdown of description of those those eight classes. So CP1, uh, you're going to have these people who are using a power chair uh, or assistance for mobility. They really don't have the ability to move uh, a manual wheelchair on their own. Um, athletes in this in this uh, classification, uh, bocce is a sport that they would be competing in at the Paralympic level. Uh, CP2, able to prepare a manual wheelchair, but very poor um, strength in the arms and legs and trunk, not going to be really functional at it. Again, bocce is another, um, another is a sport for this classification group as well. And these would be considered athletes with high support needs. Um, historically, um, different terms of views, they would be athletes who are more severely disabled or low functioning. The proper terminology currently being used, the current terminology being used is athletes with high support needs, HSN. Now we get into a little bit uh, higher functioning classes of the wheelchair classes, CP3, CP4s, and as you get into these, really, um, this opens up virtually all the wheelchair sports are open to the athletes within these classes. Uh, although when they compete against people, oftentimes they're going to be grouped against other athletes um, that don't necessarily have cerebral palsy, brain injury, stroke, but might have uh, spinal cord injuries uh, that uh, render those athletes with quadriplegia. So they have impairment in all four limbs, much as these athletes uh, would have. Into the ambulatory classes, CP5, CP6. Uh, CP5 um, would be the athletes with the most severe impairments within the ambulatory CP classes. As we move our way up, we get into the least severely disabled. And as you can see, CP5, you're going to see um, uh, the CP affects the athlete on both sides of the body, maybe using a walker, maybe using crutches. Uh, might be able to run, but not going to do it for extremely long distances. The gait's not going to be pretty at all, and uh, long-distance running would be contraindicated for CP5 athletes. Uh, CP6 athletes, um, you're going to see a lot of spasticity in these athletes, especially as they get tired. Uh, they can uh, they can be ambulatory, or they, obviously they're ambulatory, probably not not necessarily using assistive devices, can run again, but again, uh, um, it, they're going to be, it's going to be, their disability is going to be noticeable as they're running. CP7 and 8, this is where we get into uh, the highest functioning athletes. Uh, a lot of uh, your football seven-a-side players are going to be in these classes. A lot of your better players, you're going to see a lot of runners in these classes. Uh, a lot of track athletes uh, and some really good swimmers as well. Um, and with CP7, you've got uh, the hemiplegics. Uh, a lot of times you're going to see that presented as those athletes that may have one upper extremity that is very limited function. If some of you have seen uh, Josh Blue, um, who the famous comedian who also was on the United States seven-a-side football team, soccer uh, team, he's a hemi he has hemiplegia. Uh, and uh, then as we get into CP8, minimal diplegia, hemiplegia, um, or a movement disorder that uh, meets minimum disability. And again, we get into that minimal disability, this kind of falls into that les uh, So if uh, someone has a movement disability that doesn't really fall right in there, this could be a classification that they get put into. Now with that, we're going to move into some of the, I'm not going to go into detail through a lot of these sports. I uh, just want to give you an overview of some of the different sports and the different classes that there are. So archery, Paralympic sport. We've got uh, the wheelchair classes and the standing class. Um, also, what uh, you isn't uh, really in there uh, is the AR1, AR2. You're going to see 
in AR1, ARW1 rather, those also going to, can, uh, um, it's going to have athletes within that classification that have upper extremity amputations. And one of our best archers in the United States uh, only has one arm. And he pulls, uh, he pulls the bow back with his mouth, uses the other arm to steady the bow, and he's an extremely accomplished archer. And uh, you can Google uh, or YouTube uh, one-armed archer, and you, you're going to find some great visuals of him competing. Athletics, um, also known as track, you know, internationally, track and field is known as athletics, the singular term. Here we call it track and field. There's a great visual of some amputee runners. And here's a great visual of some uh, wheelchair racers. And I believe that's Amanda McGrory in the middle there, who uh, you might see on uh, at BP stations, BP gas stations. She's one of the featured and, and uh, sponsored Paralympic athletes. Uh, going into London. Here's a double lower extremity amputee throwing a javelin. Another great visual. And track and field uh, offers competition to athletes from all the disability groups, all the classification categories. Uh, so as you can see there. We'll go through those in just a second here. So remember for the visually impaired classes we had B1, B2, B3. In athletics, they compete in 11, 12, 13. Uh, the intellectual, people with intellectual disability compete in class 20 in track and field. Uh, again, the CP classes 1 through 8 for track and field. Their class is 31 through 38. One uh, classification we didn't really talk about, which falls under that Les Autres, is the dwarfs. They are class 40, and you can see the different criteria. And it's a, it's a pretty simple, straightforward height measurement for males and for females if they qualify within the dwarf classification. And the class 40s uh, also encompasses all the people with amputations, uh, 42 through 46. And as you get into 42, 44, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, uh, the different uh, classifications depend on if it's an upper, lower, single, double uh, amputee. And then the 51 through 58 are the different levels of spinal cord injury. The field classes, uh, very similar to the track classes. Uh, well, I want to back up one minute. Uh, we had these athletic classes. So this is just overall general categorization of the classifications in athletics. Now we get specifically into field. Uh, one of the things you might note here, you don't see an F31 class. You don't see uh, an F51 class. Um, you've got 52 through 53 uh, and 58. Um, so you can see how that breaks down. And as we get into the track classes, um, you don't have a T40 class. The dwarfs do not have um, track events within Paralympic sport. And when you think about the biomechanics of a dwarf and the physiology of a dwarf, um, running just for the most part is contraindicated, so that's not one of the classes that's available. Um, and then for track, rather than 52 through 58, we've got 51 through 54, where the 51s and 52s are people that have limitations in all four extremities. 53s, 54s would just be people with limitations in their lower extremities and would have varying degrees of trunk control. 53s would have some trunk control, 54s would have uh, all trunk control. Control and 54s, uh, people with amputations, lower extremity amputations, who want to compete in uh, wheelchair racing rather than ambulatory racing, will compete in the T54 classification. Bocce, we talked about bocce a little bit. Uh, again, a sport for athletes with uh, cerebral palsy, brain injury, and stroke. Uh, it is a sport for athletes with high support needs, so you're not going to see anybody in that uh, CP8 classification competing in bocce. Bocce has four classifications, BC1 through BC4. And you can see the first two classifications here. And I do want to point out, as you see in BC1, foot, foot players, um, athletes with uh, arthrogryposis, um, and if you're not familiar with that disability, it's a disability that affects the uh, the growth and development of the upper extremities. So often you're going to see 
those athletes with arthrogryposis that have extremely short or completely missing arms. They will have hands, but on very, very short uh, upper, upper extremity limbs or arm, hands that actually simply protrude directly or attached to the shoulder joint. So very limited arm function, uh, not really able to throw a bocce ball, so they can actually use their foot. Uh, they can have an assistant place the bocce ball on their foot, and they can use their foot to propel the ball onto the court. And here you see the BC3 and BC4 classes, and I won't read those. You can read those for yourself. Wheelchair basketball, the sport near and dear to my heart. Great shot of USA playing Japan. And I believe that's actually a U23 tournament, not a Paralympic uh, competition. But uh, to compete in wheelchair basketball, player must have a permanent lower extremity disability. It must, uh, it must uh, impair them from playing uh, able-bodied basketball competitively. Internationally, the classification system used is based on a point system from 1.5, uh, from 1, rather, to 4.5. I'm not sure why that says 1.5 to 4.5. It's 1. Uh, 1 to 4.5. According to their physical physical function. Uh, now, we talked about the difference between individual sport versus team sport. Now, here's a great example. So you've got five players on the floor. They could have a classification anywhere from 1 to 4.5. And how do you make that equitable? Uh, what if a team puts five four fives on the floor and the other team only has one four five and three twos and a three five and a one and a two five to choose from well that's where the point system comes into play so as you can see in that third bullet point there's a total number of points that cannot be exceeded on the floor at any given time and for international play that number is 14 points so you've got five players on the floor who have a classification from 1 to 4.5 by half points, their total number of points cannot exceed 14. So that's the way, and that's very similar to wheelchair rugby, and we'll see that in a few moments. Uh, that's how we make an equitable playing field uh, within team sports. And again, I'm not going to read these to you. You can, you can read them, and you can also go on to the IWBF.org website, and they've got complete uh, instructions and classification manuals that go into detail about how you would actually classify um, these. Now, one the things I will say is you, no you notice that I just have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 4.5. The 4.5 classification, again, is for that person with a minimum disability. So uh, in a wheelchair, a person with a minimum disability would be no different than if I sat in a wheelchair. I, I don't have a disability. I don't have a physical disability. So if I sat in a wheelchair, a person with minimum disability, we would be virtually equal within the chair. Now, I did not fit, I did not, again, put in the half points in here because, as you can see, if a player doesn't fit in an exact class, say it's not really a 2, not really a 3, and they're going to be a 2.5. Wheelchair basketball in the USA, um, we still use a medical classification system. We're in the process of moving away from that and going into the functional system. Uh, it is a functional system very similar to the IWBF system. Currently, we do not use the half points. Uh, that may be changing in the very near future, but uh, as it stands, uh, we are transitioning to a functional system be, to become up to date and to meet the standards of best practice, and hopefully uh, we will get that uh, completed very soon. And uh, if you open up, uh, if you download the PowerPoint, you can just click on that uh, hyperlink there, the IWBF classification manual, and get in-depth knowledge of wheelchair basketball classification. And as promised, wheelchair rugby, uh, called quad rugby, murder ball in the United States. And this is a sport for people who have impairment in all four limbs. Uh, many people have the misnomer that a person who is a quadriplegic can't move their arms at all. Well, that's not the case. Quadriplegia or tetraplegia simply means that a person has an impairment in all four limbs. Uh, they may have decent arm function, very little hand-finger function. Uh, it all depends on the specific disability. And then, as you can see, uh, the classification for rugby, again, uh, they utilize a half-point system from 
one half point to three and a half points. And they're, they have four players on the rugby court at any given time, and they can never have more than a total of eight points on the floor. Cycling, there's a lot of different types of cycling. Um, and again, you've got uh, all the, well, for cycling, uh, you've got uh, the CP classes, visually impaired les autres, and amputees. Spinal cord injury isn't in there because hand cycling is actually a separate, separate sport from cycling. It's, it's, hand cycling is its own sport. So you can see here um, that uh, everyone, everyone within the CP classes can compete, and you can see that the CP 1 through 4 and is competes in Division One and uses a tricycle. Uh, CP people in CP classes five and six also can use a tricycle and compete in Division Two. And then we get into the bicycle competitions for the for the CP five and six in Division Three and CP seven and eight in Division Four. Uh, visually impaired and again uh, people with visual impairments compete in cycling as a tandem team. Uh, there's a pilot and a stoker. The, uh, the sighted guide is the pilot and, of course, would sit on the front of the tandem cycle. Uh, the visually impaired cyclist is the stoker and would be in the second position. And uh, the cycling classes are the same, B1, B2, and B3. So now there are people with incomplete spinal cord injuries that can ride bicycles as well. So here we can see the the LC classes, the locomotor disabled cyclists, and you can see the differences between uh, each of those categories there. And then of course hand cycling for people uh, with incomplete or complete spinal cord injuries, also people with um, amputations who do not want to use prosthetics can compete in the hand cycle divisions as well. And again, I won't read those to you. You can read them for yourself, and you can download the PowerPoint and, uh, and spend all the time reading those you want. Equestrian, a lot of people don't realize equestrian is a Paralympic event. And uh, again, I'm not going to read these to you. I'll let you peruse the equestrian, equestrian information for yourself. Wheelchair fencing. Uh, Excellent, excellent sport uh, is on the rise. The USA actually fares fairly well in uh, wheelchair fencing. Um, it would be nice if we could fare that well on the able-bodied side. Um, and then again, as you can see here, open to people with amputations, with cerebral palsy, brain injury, stroke, and people who utilize wheelchairs for daily mobility, so people with spinal cord injury. You can see those three classes. Goalball. Goalball is a disability specific sport, and you can see that uh, those two athletes in the picture are wearing uh, masks, and so that hopefully leads you to the conclusion that this is a sport for people with visual impairments and blindness. And again, we've got three, um, we have the three uh, classifications within the visually impaired groups B1, B2, B3. Judo, another Paralympic sport for people with visual impairments and blindness. And again, now we've got uh, actually two classifications going on in judo because you've got the three uh, visual impaired classifications and then you've also got the weight classes and you've also got male-female. Powerlifting. Um, I've seen some amazing performance by disabled athletes pushing up weight. Uh, you just, you would not believe. People who think that uh, people with physical disability cannot benefit from strength and conditioning training uh, need to watch a uh, Paralympic powerlifting competition. So again, as you can see, uh, powerlifting combine, can uh, take uh, almost all the different uh, disability groups, people with visual impairment is in, are not in there because when you think about powerlifting, how would a visual impairment really um, impair a person uh, versus a person with a visual impairment versus a person without in terms of powerlifting? 
they really won. So that is not a classification that competes at the Paralympic level in powerlifting. And they people do complete compete across disability by weight class. So a person with a spinal cord injury who weighs 100 kilograms is going to pe compete against a person with a lower extremity amputation that weighs 100 kilograms. Um, it simply it, that's simply a straightforward calculation. Now, for people with amputations, there is a formula that's used because obviously they're missing some weight from the amputation. So there's a formula that is used to add weight back on um, so that they are competing equitably and fairly in the correct category should they have had all their limbs. And here you can see how powerlifting defines minimum disability. Now, obviously, when we talk about minimum disability, or we talk about disability with powerlifting, someone could have uh, some type of limited function in their upper extremities. Well, one of the criteria for powerlifting is you need to extend that weight to a locked elbow position. So, if you know if someone isn't capable of doing that, and they could only if they had a loss of 90 degrees in both elbow joints, they'd have an unfair advantage. So one of the one of the criteria criteria for eligibility to compete powerlifting is to have the ability to extend the arms with no more loss than 20 degrees of extension in either elbow, um, which still is quite a bit, but uh, that is uh, one of the criteria for an equitable and fair playing field. Sailing, another Paralympic sport and uh, open to all the different categories and again I won't read those to you you can read them for yourself or you can do some more research online for sailing classification shooting Paralympic sport very popular and we've got the three main classes and as you can see uh, you've got pistol and rifle categories you've got upper limbs uh, you've got visually impaired and then you can break these down into subcategories as well. And uh, again, I'm not going to read those to you. I'll let those let you read those for yourselves. They're fairly straightforward. Five-side soccer. Once again, you see the three athletes in this picture have masks over their eyes, which again hopefully leads you to uh, the conclusion that this is a sport for people with visual impairments and blindness. So five-side soccer, now some of you might be wondering, well, how the heck do they do that? Uh, same as with goal ball, which I think I actually failed to mention. The ball has a bell in it, so you can actually uh, locate the ball by sound. It is five-side. It is a smaller field. Um, and the goalkeepers can be sighted, so um, <laughs> that does uh, does uh, allow for the scores to be a little bit lower than they would be if everyone had a visual impairment. And obviously, at that second bullet point, you see uh, the goalkeeper may not have been registered with FIFA, the international governing body for football, in the last five years. Now, obviously, that happened because people were simply recruiting FIFA goalies to come and be on the visually impaired teams and compete. Uh, I wouldn't say that necessarily gives them an unfair advantage, but those those teams that have the ability to recruit those types of athletes surely would have an advantage. In addition to five-side soccer at the Paralympic level, there's also seven-side soccer. Again, this is a sport for athletes with cerebral palsy, brain injury, and stroke. It is for the ambulatory classes, and again, you see those four ambulatory classes. And as we had said earlier, the majority of people on uh, the, the, the field, the seven on each side, are going to be from uh, the seven and eight classes. But it is required that at least one player from the CP5, CP6 classification be on the field at all times. So that really, again, goes to help um, not only level the playing field, but provide opportunity for people that have more severe disabilities to uh, participate and enjoy the sport. Swimming, another one of those uh, sports that it has uh, people from all the classification categories. And you can see the breakdown there. 
So for swimming, you're going to have different classifications. S for freestyle, so you could have an S11. And an S11, if we go back, is going to be a swimmer with a visual impairment. And that would be equivalent to the B1. So an S11 is going to be a, a totally blind, a blind swimmer who is going to have to wear opaque goggles and is going to be swimming the freestyle stroke, right? So S is for freestyle, S11. Uh, so opaque goggles, totally blind, um, swimming the freestyle. And you may say, well, how do, how do the swimmers with visual impairments know they're coming close to the wall? And some people have said, well, they must count their strokes. Well, no, actually, there's uh, at each end of the pool, um, if it's a more than a one length race or if it's a single, just a, a single length, full length race at the end, uh, there's going to be a person called a tapper. And that tapper is going to have a pole, a pole rather, with uh, a ball at the end. Sometimes it's a tennis ball, sometimes it's a foam ball. And they're going to just simply tap the swimmer on the head when they get within a predetermined number of strokes or distance from the end of the pool so they know that the, uh, that the touch pad is coming. And then, as you can see, SB stands for breaststroke. SM is the individual medley. Um, so you've got, uh, you've got all the different strokes accounted for within the classifications. Table tennis, very popular sport. Again, a number of classifications. You've got the, uh, the classifications for athletes who use wheelchairs, the standing classifications, and also an intellectually disabled classification for table tennis. The rules are a little bit different. This course, of course, this isn't uh, a session about the rules. Uh, you can look those up. But uh, table tennis is a very popular sport and a lot of opportunity in the United States for athletes with disabilities who want to compete in table tennis to get to the international level. Sitting volleyball. And again, you can read uh, the minimum disability criteria specific to sitting uh, volleyball. An interesting thing with, uh, with uh, sitting volleyball, there's no point system on there. So one of the things, one of the criteria they have is you may only have one person with minimum disability on the court at any time. Uh, the rest of the team just simply has to have one of the higher levels of disability. And uh, one of the things we don't have uh, within this, this presentation that I need to add, uh, sledge hockey. Sledge hockey is a very interesting sport uh, in that it uh, does not have a classification system or a point system outside of minimum disability. Uh, to be eligible to play sledge hockey, you have to meet their minimum disability criteria, and then you simply put your team on the ice and play. Uh, very odd for a Paralympic sport. Uh, that's something that uh, may change in the future. Uh, it's one of the only sports that uh, operates in that manner. And uh, we'll see what happens in the future. But that is a basic overview as Classification 101, Paralympic Sport Classification. For more information, you can click on that hyperlink and you can find a lot of uh, additional information on classification. On one of the things I want to close with um, and make sure that you understand is classification is not about classifying a person. Classification does not classify a person. It classifies an impairment. So you have an athlete, a person, who has a physical disability. Classification aims to define that disability and assign it a category so that you can group athletes with similar disabilities and function to compete against one another. So classification is not about classifying a person. Now, why do I bring this up? This is very important, and hopefully you're sticking with me on this. I have seen this too many times firsthand, especially with junior players. Uh, and it happens with visually impaired people as well. But uh, with junior athletes, predominantly junior athletes with spinal cord injuries, uh, you, you know, before you can take them to an event and get them officially classified by trained classifiers, you give them uh, provisional 
classification. You evaluate them at practice and in training to get an idea of where they're going to compete when they do go to a competition. And many, many times I've seen, seen an athlete, when you think about the wheelchair track classifications, T54, uh, that is the highest functioning uh, group in wheelchair track. Um, you could also flip that around and say that's the least disabled class. Now, what happens when you have a 13-year-old who you said, okay, I think you're a T54, you know, these are the times you need to hit, here's who you'd be competing against. Um, they take that, they're, they're training, you know, they're trying to hit those training marks based on a classification of a T54. You take them to the first competition, classifiers get a look at them and go, you know what, you you know, you really got a few things going on. We see this, we see that, we see some... Uh, we see some deficiencies in the in the trunk movement and uh, trunk function, and you're a T53. Well, as a coach, you're going, oh, that's awesome. We've been training you at the, to compete against T54s. Now you're a T53. But here's what happens: that youth comes out of that classification crying because, as coaches, we don't do a good enough job. And I, I would I would even venture as classifiers, we don't do a good enough job of educating the athletes that. Classification is about classifying their disability, not them. It's about class categorizing the impairment. That youth will come out of that classification session crying because someone in their mind they just got told they're more disabled than they thought they were. And that's one of the things that we need to be mindful of as coaches as we're dealing with classification and dealing particularly with youth to get them to understand that classification is not defining them as a person. It's simply defining their impairment so that they can compete equitably. It has no bearing on them as an individual. So similar things happen with athletes with visual impairments where they go in and take their eye test and they try to, because they want to do well, they try to memorize the eye chart. Well, if they memorize the eye chart, they're gonna get classified instead of possibly as a B2 as a B3 when they're really a B2, and that's not helping them, and that's not what the classification session is about. The classification session is about accurately defining and categorizing the impairment, which is completely separate from the person. So that's what I want to leave you with. I uh, hope you enjoyed the session. hope you got a lot out of it. If you have any questions, please call me or email me, and good luck with the quiz.